Hello everybody, welcome to Black Belt Life. My name is Darren Myers and today we are going to be having a great talk with a, actually a good friend of mine and somebody I've uh, worked with for a long time. He's actually from a different style of karate is from, from me, which is okay. <laughs> and I'm very happy to introduce ninth degree black belt, Hanshi Brian Hobson. Hello there. Hey, How are you guys? Hey, Hanshi. How you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm doing fine. And yourself? I'm doing fantastic. <laughs> I really appreciate you being on. And I think a lot of people are excited to hear what you have to say today and what kind of a conversation we can have. So this is going to be a lot of fun. So you've been doing karate now for how many decades? <laughs> I started in 1982. Um, so you can do the math on that, <laughs> but it's been a long time, but I, I've enjoyed it. Fantastic. And how yeah. what got you started? Actually, um, I, I started in Kung Fu, uh, I think when I was around nine years old. And uh, that was back when uh, Fort Monroe was still a fort <laughs> of, of the army base. And um, my mom took me, there's a YMCA actually that was over there. It used to be in the Chamberlain, or I don't, I don't really remember the the setup, but that's basically what it was. And um, we had a, a kung fu guy that taught us, I think, once or maybe twice a week. And uh, he was a dentist in the army. And when he got stationed somewhere else, then of course, it the program was over. And uh, I think I was about nine at that time, and we did it for probably close to a year or so. And then. Um, I never forget, I was 12 years old and I was, you know, watching TV Saturday morning and my mother back then, she was really politically active and uh, what was happening, she said, uh, come on and go with me. I said, well, where are you going? She said, well, um, I'm going to go register some people to vote today. I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm going to sit here and, you know, watch whatever. And, and she said, she looked at me and she said, well, there's a karate school that's in the mall that I'm going to be at and you can watch that. And if you like it, we'll sign you up. So I got my clothes on, I got in the car with her and my eyes were glued for the entire time from 10 o'clock that morning to probably like two o'clock that afternoon, just watching the kids class, the teens class. I saw black belts come in and just work out on their own. And uh, after that, I was hooked. There you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah. So, uh, a uh, 12 year old kid just got mesmerized by it and mesmerized the beginning of yes. now it's been almost a lifetime of, of uh, martial arts study that's great who do you think are the <laughs> top three people who've been the most influential to you well that that's that's pretty easy um of course my first instructor um and my last instructor and their instructor <laughs> but uh first my first instructor was uh Hanshi frank hargrove and he was a trailblazer, uh, um, being, you know, uh, he, he, he lived the, the dream of karate that everybody wants to dream, if you will. And he was a serviceman in the Air Force, got stationed in Okinawa. And uh, his, his, his hero growing up was Genghis Khan. And he knew that, you know, all those guys knew martial arts back then. So it was, this was his chance to start in martial arts himself. And so once he got uh, stationed in Okinawa, that's, he jumped in on the first dojo. And of course, there was some servicemen that already told, that were already training there, told him where to go and that type of thing. But um, he was the guy that kind of stuck to it. Um, he was the guy that just didn't want to do karate and then go back to America and forget about it because there usually wasn't any karate gyms or dojos back then. He was a guy that after a while, he said, you know what, I want to bring this back to America and be a karate instructor. So after maybe, I think, two, uh, three or four years in Okinawa, and I could have those times wrong, he uh, got stationed here in Langley Air Force Base in Hampton and started a club. And he realized even at, you know, at black belt rank, and I think he was a third or fourth don at the time, he really didn't know how to teach. He knew the karate, but he wanted to learn how to teach. So he took the GI Bill, got stationed, got, um, got out of the military, took the GI Bill, went to um, mainland Japan and went to college there. 
and uh, he went to Sophia University, which I think is an English university that is uh, has a satellite campus there on um, mainland Japan. And he, you know, learned a lot of Japanese martial arts, uh, Iaido as well, um, Judo and Jodo while he was in college. He was on his college karate team. And then he would pop back and forth to Okinawa to train for months at a time whenever he was in between classes and that type of thing. So all in all, he did nine and a half years in Okinawa and mainland Japan. So he's fluent in Japanese, of course. And um, he was the trailblazer. He was the first non-Asian fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth Don in Shonru. So he was on uh, uh, numerous talk shows. Um, uh, there, there was something I think that he was telling me that was called Tokyo Tonight, which is the equivalent of the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson back then. Wow. And uh, he was fe featured on that type of thing. So, yeah, he was that trailblazer that everybody just kind of goes, wow, you know, you had that vision He's and you gave up so much of life. Yeah, yeah. So that was him. Uh, I guess the second guy, of definitely the second guy, was Hanshi Nagaza. He was um, the true gentleman of karate. He was able to, you know, uh, to me, I guess he was the guy that was a really good instructor, gave you really good insight, told you all those things that you want to do. And he was touchable. He was reachable. You could talk to him and just like anybody else. And, uh, and that's what really, I said, you know, you have to have the, you know, as a karate instructor, you want to be an instructor, but you don't want to be untouchable and people afraid to talk to you and that type of thing. And he was that guy that to me, uh, personified all of those things. And that's what I really enjoyed about him. And lastly, uh, both of their instructors and, and, and consequently, Hanshi Hargrove and Hanshi Nagaza, they were um, classmates. So they got along really well um, in Okinawa, that type of thing. And um, uh, so it was good that they, you know, enjoyed each other's company when I brought those two guys together. But uh, their, their instructor, uh, Shigeru Nakazato sensei he, um, you know, when I was uh, orange belt at the age of 13, Hanshi Hargrove brought him to uh, Hampton and my eyes were just huge. My mind was blown, heart just thumping. And I was like, this is a real 10th degree black belt. I remember I had to take off school early. <laughs> I got my, I convinced my mother to, you know, so I could meet him at the airport, you know. And then we had a, a camp and I was an orange belt at, and it was probably about 120 to 200 people. It seemed like, I don't know, but it seemed like at least 120 people at that camp, most of them being black belts and me just sitting there going, wow, look at this. And uh, it, that was a huge influence on my life and, and you know, actually seeing somebody of that historic nature back then. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, just, how many people get the opportunity to do that in their entire life? And you as a kid to be able to meet somebody and train with somebody of that caliber, mm -hmm. that, that really mm -hmm. was quite an opportunity. You were very fortunate. Uh, it, it, training as a kid, of course, uh, training under, especially under uh, Frank Hargrove, a very traditional instructor. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think you gained the most out of it as a kid? Oh, wow. Uh, you know, I was a shy kid. I was very athletic, but I was a shy kid. So that changed. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, changed. Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, when you start gaining confidence doing other things, then it kind of bleeds over into other parts of your life. And uh, but, you know, like to me, you know, you said, yeah, I want to learn karate. I was like, great. Yeah, I want to do this. And, you know, to me, karate was learning how to defend yourself, learning how to, you know, be able to protect yourself and your family and your friends. And so I had no idea what kata was. And um, when I started learning, I said, OK, this is kata this is what I have to do. But then they said, OK, it's a tournament coming up and uh, you should do it. I said, OK, great. Let's do it. And next thing you know, they're saying, well, you got to do kata and kumite. I was like, well, I don't want to do kata. It's like, no, that is the rule. In this dojo, you if you go to tournament, you must do kata and you must do kumite. And I got up there and was just as shy as I could be, could barely pronounce my kata and uh, barely wanted to go through the moves. But eventually I got over it. 
um, you know, I believe that karate or, or any type of decent karate program will expose those things that you're not most comfortable with. And with that exposure, it should help you, you know, mature into being more comfortable with that situation. So yeah. that's what, yeah. that's what has kind of really helped me and other, other areas as well. But I would say that was the main one. And, you know, for me to have a dojo now and, to, you know, get in front of people and be able to teach, that started with a small group of maybe two, you know, making brown a black belt and say, okay, you got to go teach this guy something. And I might not even know him, but then eventually the group got bigger. And next thing you know, I'm leading the class and now I've got my own dojo. So, you know, that, that that's what I think would help me the most. That's great. Fantastic. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, the confidence, I, I would probably say is the probably the number one thing of why parents bring kids to us. Um, yes. You know, it, it, with the bullying that goes on and the um, just that spending, personally myself, I think spending so much time in front of a screen, kids don't have that interaction to develop confidence. And so this is just the perfect activity for them. So I agree. I agree. I just want to add on to that. You know, um, a lot of times parents come to come to us and they say, you know, my child is getting bullied. Da, 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 da. Can karate help me? And we go, yeah, it can. But usually it's not a quick fix, right? We can't say, okay, when he does this, you're going to do that. That takes time. But what we want to do is build up their confidence by, you know, attaining belts, maybe going to tournaments and winning. And then that building that confidence usually kind of keeps people away from them simply because most bullies, they don't want to deal with somebody that has a, 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 a strong confidence. They want to deal with somebody that has confidence issues and they can sense that and say, this is the one I want to pick on because they can't do anything back to me. So, but it takes time. And I tell parents that a lot. And um, eventually, you know, they, they, I, if they, you know, adhere to the program, it, uh, it, 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 it works. It works. It really does. It, it absolutely it, does. It and does. it's like you're saying, the bully is looking for a victim. He's looking for a victim yes. that is not confident. And karate develops that confidence that just exudes from you. Uh, and it's it's amazing what it does. Um, yeah. Now, t speaking of teaching and the dojo and all, this has been a challenging year, to say, like, to say yeah. the least, and like no other mm -hmm. we've ever been through. Industry experts are telling us that over 7,000 dojo across the USA have gone out of business. Mm. How have you survived? How have you made it through this past year? <laughs> By the grace of God. <laughs> no doubt. Rolling a dice, I don't know. But actually, um, I've been lucky to have a really good staff of black belts. Um, they're like uh, little brothers and sisters to me. Um, also, and you know, I have older black girls that are older than me in age, but um, you know, just kind of holding everything together. I was lucky enough to, uh, ha I teach also at uh, the community college here at the karate, uh, the karate program there. And of course, over time, you get to know students that are really interested in karate and they're local, so they stay around sometimes. And um, uh, this young lady named Savannah that I, that we've I've introduced you to as well. Uh, she she you know when when Zoom was going around, I was like I didn't even know what Zoom was. And <laughs> she, I talked to her about it. She was like it's probably on your phone. I was like for real and zip through it and yeah it is on there. <laughs> you know it shows you how much I know. But yeah, she kind of helped us through Zoom. We figured it out together. But she was the catalyst. But again, my instructors. They, uh, we band together and we um, try to get through Zoom. We did that for about three and a half, four months. And uh, and thank God our, our governor opened us up so we could start training in a different ways. And uh, we're 10 feet away now and wearing masks and gloves and stuff like that and checking people in. And uh, But between that and um, I would say Cobra Kai coming <laughs> from the school. Yeah, uh, Cobra Kai. Quite a few yeah. teenagers uh, uh, say, yeah, you know, the reason why I wanted to do it was because of Cobra Kai. And I go, yeah, that's great. Because um, I remember back when the original Karate Kids started and this boom of kids came into the dojo. Right. And uh, it, it was great. It was great. 
1984, baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was great. Yeah. No doubt yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, and this has been a, a, a tough year, I think, like, like with my dojo as well. I think we just made the right moves, the right decisions at the right time. Zoom. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Mm -hmm. Saved us, you know, to say the least. Yeah. yeah. And but I, I, I think I've been busier and worked harder this year than I probably have in all the other years combined. Um, mm -hmm. But we have, you and I, we put on a tournament every year, or two tournaments every year, mm -hmm. and we haven't been able to put on any of the special events this year, yeah. no tournaments, clinics, camps, et cetera. Yeah. Can you imagine what this year would have been like if we were still putting on those events? With, with all the restrictions and stuff? Is that what you asked? Yeah. Or, oh yeah, it'd be weird. It'd be somewhat weird. And uh, frustrating at the same time with all the stuff that you have to consider. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, you know, I, I've called you and I've had numerous calls and emails to me and going, "Hey man, these guys want to have a tournament, man. What do you want to do?" And then you kind of reel me back in and go, "Listen, man, just hold your horses." <laughs> and, I, and I say, "Okay, yeah, you you, you make sense." So it, you know, it's it's tough and. Uh, the frustration uh, sets in and everybody's ready to get over it and um, everybody's ready to go back to normal. But uh, I think we just have a little bit more to go and uh, uh, hopefully we will get back to karate as we used to know it. Yeah, and hopefully that's going to be soon. Um, yeah, I just heard that the Nationals got postponed to the um, to the to the, the Labor Day weekend, I believe. Right. I go, wow, yep. That's amazing. Yep. So that yeah, that'll be in Chicago. Yeah. So Chicago yeah. should be should be good. Uh, yeah. I think that was a good move on their part to uh, mm -hmm. put it off that long to get everybody yeah. a chance to get not only us Caught as up. adults, you know, vaccinated and that kind of thing, but mm -hmm. also kids and and, and so yeah. forth, so everybody yeah. can compete safely. Yeah. Um, now you're with the Kyobukan organization, which was yes. formerly under and founded by say a nakaza mm -hmm. and you're 50 51 somewhere there 51. 51. i'll take it all there you go yes. <laughs> and looking good for your age that's for sure yeah, i'm trying to hold on man there you go. <laughs> and you are now a ninth degree and the head of that organization i mean yeah that's an incredible position to be in for somebody at your age i mean that's that's yeah. kind of a young fan it's fantastic did you ever think you'd yeah. be in a position like that as a 12 year old Absolutely kid not. starting out <laughs> Absolutely or looking not. in the window of the karate school in the mall? no <laughs> <laughs> i remember vividly uh like again going back to uh, frank hargrove he was you know like i said he was he came back finally from japan after nine and a half years of training as a six don and you go man that's that's kind of quick for a six don but he totally devoted his life to that six don in karate um i think a knee on in kodakan judo uh a knee on in uh, eido and um, and i think a shodan in jodo so he was you know he was dedicating everything to it and i said to myself there's no way i could ever get the six don because you know he did that thing in japan i didn't think he could get past that because right. i thought it was kind of over with for him because I didn't understand it. I was 12. But my whole, I remember he had the red and white belt back then. I was like, wow, that's, you know, and I knew that for us, the ninth and 10th was a solid red. And uh, his highest ranked student was a guy named Montez Dennis at the time. And he was a Renshi. And he had the red and white with the black on the back. And I said, you know what? I want to be right where Montez Dennis is. So in essence, I guess he influenced me as well. Cause he was a nice guy, terrific karateka. And um, and uh, I said, you know, I want to make it up to where he is. So I thought fifth would be as high as I could ever go. And uh, here I am, you know. I, you know, I tell people all the time, just stick around. Just keep coming yeah, in the door. Yeah. Just keep, keep kicking on the mat. That's the hardest part. Keep yeah, kicking, exactly. keep, you know, no matter what, you know, and it doesn't have to be, a everyday dedication, wake up and do a million push-ups, and you know it doesn't have to be, you know, have to do an Olympic that dream. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it doesn't have to be an Olympic dream or anything. Just you know, enjoy your karate two or three days a week, you know, and uh, get some benefit from it long term, and that is that is that is golden. 
Absolutely. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, I remember us two talking about, you know, going to, you know, our instructors going to camps or putting on camps. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're way back in the back of the room going, man, I'll never get up there with those guys. And slowly but surely, we just kind of stay consistent over all these decades. And here we are, you know. I mean, I'm sure you you probably had the same ceiling for yourself or or goal oh, for yeah. yourself, and you superseded that goal now. You know. Yeah, it's it's very humbling. Um, I'm honored to be where I am as well. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's very humbling because now the responsibility is yes. huge. You know. Yes. So yes. Uh, that that kind of weighs on your shoulders a lot as well. Absolutely. You know? Yes. So you yeah. Know, and we want to see our, these styles, you know, continue and continue mm-hmm. past us and beyond us. So, yeah. you know, we have a lot of work to do to, to yeah. uh, you know, continue to put it out there. Yeah, I was I was kind of I, I want to kind of share this as well. You know, uh, my instructor passed away at 2013. So I was I was only 43 at that time. And I had just been promoted to Hachidan, which was is still young for a Hachidan. And uh, but, you know, circumstances was I was his highest student. So, mm-hmm. you know, that was his last wish. And uh, it was passed on to me by his son and his and his wife to be that sole heir. But I said, I just didn't feel comfortable being uh, or toting around a red belt uh, in a ninth dawn telling people that being so young. So I made a, um, basically a, uh, I told my students, my black belts, of course, and I showed them the documentations and the videos that we took while that was all going on. But I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't take that belt or those uh, or that title until I turned 50. So last February is when I actually um, put the whole thing together. That's gotcha, what gotcha. Yeah. That, that's very humbling yeah. of you, or humble of yeah. yourself there. You yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Because most you know. people would just throw it out there, and you know, yeah. I am the greatest. You know, that kind of and thing. everybody's just kind of shaking. And I'm sure I still have people that are going, "Ah, it's kind of young," but you know, that's, it, it is it, what it is. Yeah, the, you gotta, it's, gotta it's go where you were. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So, what's in the future for Kilbacon and Brian Hobson? Well, currently we have uh, about 10 dojo or 10 or 11 dojo clubs uh, worldwide. We just added a club to uh, LA, Los Angeles, which is, we're excited about that, Jason Knight over there. And also we uh, uh, added a dojo to uh, South America, I mean, excuse me, South Africa, a big, big difference. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) a guy named Andres Douglas, he's a, a godon. And um, I was actually supposed to go to South Africa in, I think, the beginning of April of last year. And uh, COVID hit in March. And I was going, no, no, I've always wanted to go, you know. And um, it's, uh, you know, I haven't met him yet, just kind of on Zoom and uh, through phone conversations, that type of thing. And uh, uh, so we're looking forward to, 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 to meeting each other and training with each other and sharing. But, uh, you know, we want to maintain uh, the teachings of what Nagaza Sensei um, uh, gave us and, and try to expand with quality, not necessarily quantity. Mm-hmm. And uh, just to make sure, because that's the reason really why he started to kill Pecan. Uh, he felt as though the organization that we were a part of at first was getting not only just too big, but the the standards were relaxed and he wanted to kind of bring those standards back to where he remembered. And that was, that was his whole goal. And I, and I totally agree with him. And, um, and so we, we uh, sat down several times over lunch and dinner and just in conversation and and decided what we were going to do and how we were going to do things. Well, you've done a great job. I've been to some of your camps and uh, mm-hmm. I appreciate the opportunity to teach at some of those and seeing what you've done with the organization and how you operate it. I, I think you're doing a fantastic job. Thank and, you. And, you know, congratulations yeah. on it. And Thank you. Hope the best for it. So, yeah. you know, our show here is Black Belt Life and about the journey to Black Belt and beyond. I think we've been talking a lot about the beyond part. Um, what, do you, <laughs> what kind of advice would you give to students who are working toward achieving their black belt? 
Uh, just same thing that we discussed before, you know, keep kicking, keep kicking. You know, there's a lot of, you know, exciting things about karate and you learn about them probably within the first six months of karate. But what students kind of don't understand is a million plateaus. And once you get to those plateaus, you have to embrace the, hey, it's a plateau, but you've got to push yourself to get to the next plateau or whatever the case may be. But, um, I mean, you really have to look again at, you know, okay, you you might have started karate because you wanted to be a tournament champion, but, and you might have attained that. Now, what's next? And we have a lot of those guys come through our dojo and they go, well, you know, I'm kind of done with the tournament thing. I want to do something else now. And that's fine. But, you know, your life can still benefit from traditional karate. So, you know, stay in the dojo, keep kicking. It's a good, healthy lifestyle. Uh, I can't tell you how much trouble I've probably stayed out of just because I'm <laughs> in the dojo <laughs> so much. <laughs> and uh, and I go, man, I'm glad I wasn't there, you know, when I was growing up and stuff like that, just because I was in the dojo doing something positive. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I can remember things, you know, and people pulling me in directions that I yeah. went, is yeah. that the right thing or the wrong thing? And usually when right. you think that, it's usually the wrong thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I stayed straight. You know, I stayed yeah. pretty, uh, I mean, I had a good yeah. time. I had, I, I've yeah. had some great yeah. experiences in my life. Yeah. But I've stayed on that straight and narrow. But I Absolutely. got to hand that to karate. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Brian, I appreciate this. Um, I, I hate to bring us down uh, after such a great talk, but uh, I know you and I both want to uh, pay honor to unfortunately one of our karate comrades that uh left us uh this week on mother's day of all times uh that was Rinchy michael eggleston mm -hmm. and Rinchy eggleston was a six degree black belt uh he'd been operating eggleston karate studio for i, I believe over 25 years and he was the AAU regional director. I know he had put on their nationals and their junior Olympics several times, uh, really devoted his life to that and his students. And he was unfortunately in a terrible car accident and uh, we lost him on Mother's Day. And uh, I know you had some connection with him. Uh, and, uh, you know, what kind of story do you have? Um, I started karate in 82, but in 1983, we started uh, tournaments um, uh, the spring of that year. So I'd probably been, I think I was uh, uh, our third belt at that time, which was gold belt for us back then when I first did my tournament. And of course you see people and you don't know, and the next thing you know, you see them again and you get more and more familiar with them over the years. And Mike was one of those guys that, you know, I saw him, but I didn't know who he was, but eventually, you know, we started to uh, talk to each other and that type of thing, but nothing, nothing big, nothing huge, no big conversations or anything like that. But one time, a um, guy named Dan Montgomery, who used to be in charge of USA Karate Federation was having this uh, tournament in um, Virginia Beach as the qualifier to go to the national. So it was that spring. And my instructor and I, and I think Rodney Cheeseman, uh, Kiyoshi Cheeseman was there as well. And uh, he, um, uh, we saw Mike and next day, you know, I was like, oh yeah, that's the same old guy we've been seeing over the years. And all of a sudden his karate was really good. I mean, I think he did a Goju Shio show for Kata and, uh, you know, me and Hargrove kind of looked at each other and was like, man, where did he get, where, where did he learn that from? Cause you know, normally his karate just wasn't that sharp. And of uh, course, and I, there's nothing against any other style, but he had been kind of bouncing around. But I think he started in Ishinru at first, and he started working with um, Sam Justice and uh, Cindy Johnson or Watson. Watson. I can't remember. Yeah, Watson. Watson, right? And then um, you know, just kind of then he kind of was on his own. And so he was, you know, buying tapes. And he had told me later on he was buying tapes and just trying to do it the best he can. <laughs> and he was a black belt. And we go, man, okay. So we, we took him to lunch after the after the tournament. And, you know, and uh, Hargrove said, well, if you're not doing anything with anybody, you need to start coming and train with us. And he said, well, how can I do that? He said, well, I have a daytime class that you could come to. And back then he was working at Winn-Dixie uh, in charge of the produce. 
And uh, I think he didn't have to be at work till like three or four o'clock. So we had traveled down from Farm Farmville uh, two hours or so and um, train for about an hour and a half and then go back. And that's how I got to know him. And um, he, we turned him into a Sean Rue guy. And I never forget, he told me, he said, you know, one day he, Hargrove pulled him up into his office. He had an office above the dojo at that time. And he, he started just talking to him about opening a dojo. He was like, man, I didn't, you know, he said, he said, I had no idea. I said, I just kind of went along with it, but I never had any inclination to have a dojo, but he was telling him how to do it and what he had to do and where he had to go and try to find a place. He said on his drive back, he, his mind was just kind of going crazy with everything. And lo and behold, a couple months later, I think he opened up. And um, so we knew each other that way. He was still coming train and that type of thing. And um, he was under uh, Hargrove's banner at that time. And um, I went off to graduate school around the age of 25. And when I came back, my first job was uh, uh, event manager at the Richmond Coliseum. So he gave me a part-time job whenever I wasn't doing events and stuff like that at his dojo. Hmm. And uh, so I was teaching there two or three days a week. And at the same time, I was doing events during the day and um, whatnot. So that was my full-time job. But uh, he invited me to his house for like, I think it was the 4th of July weekend. And I said, well, Mike, I don't know how to get there. He said, well, tell me where you live and I'll come pick you up and take you there. And at that time I was trying to save money and pay off school loans. So I was at my grandmother's house. I was living there with her and I was in my room doing something. I was kind of expecting him to come. And all of a sudden, my grandmother uh, yells out to me, Brian, come on out here and meet your cousin. And I walk out, and it's Mike Eggleston. <laughs> and, he, and I knew he had Eggleston's in our family, but it never dawned on me to think, you know, hey, let me ask, you know, these Eggleston's. Oh yeah, and that's, you know, so we became, we became, we were long lost cousins. So, yeah. So in that Richmond, it's kind of weird. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I got, uh, and that's on my, that's that was on my dad's side of the family. There's another guy in Richmond named Charles Middleton on my mother's side of the family. He owns a Kung Fu school. He's also my cousin. I used to see him at tournaments as well. And then, you know, later on, you know, somebody goes, hey, do you know Charles Middleton? I was like, maybe, who, who is he? He's like, he was at the same tournament you at. And then I, Kind of, we kind of finally connect. I was like, yeah, I've been seeing this guy ever since I was a kid. And so, yeah. So karate kind of comes in my family. <laughs> or martial yeah, no arts. Doubt. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, we're, we're, I'm really sad to hear about Mike. Um, he was a good guy. He really was. Um, really, truly a uh, good heart. I mean, you go to his yeah. tournaments, he'd always treat you great and mm -hmm. uh, help you in any way. I know he's always been good to our, uh, to our competitors and yeah. uh our sincere condolences yeah. and our prayers yeah. to the wife yeah. uh to his wife his family his uh students mm -hmm. and it's it's a great loss to the karate world and uh we'll miss you mike all right so uh brian i first of all let me just say i really appreciate you joining us today i learned a lot <laughs> so i'm sure there's a lot of folks out there that have learned a lot about you too and I, I kind of really you've given us a nice little history of what's kind of happened in uh that that part of the karate world so i mm -hmm. uh, really appreciate it and i appreciate your friendship and everything Absolutely. how can people find out more about uh brian hobson karate studio and kyobukan well we do have websites um brian hobson uh oh yep so that's it right there and uh we uh you know it's not a lot about uh us i mean it's it's um uh, uh, really geared towards the new student, of course, because we always want to stay in business. So that's what that, that website is about. But if you want to learn about our karate and our association and um, kind of what I've done in the martial arts, uh, I would recommend you go to kyobukan.com. Kyobukan, that's a mouthful, uh, dot com. But um, yeah, that's our website and how to get in contact with us and 
Uh, nice looking guy on the right. <laughs> I know. He has the same haircut <laughs> as I do. Man, I'm on the website. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We didn't ask you for a release either. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. I, I expect some royalties from that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, Brian, thank you so much. And I hope everybody's enjoyed this. Um, yeah. Please, if you if you saw this, if you liked it, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel, Black Belt Life. And uh, Brian, I look forward to seeing you very shortly. Okay. Um, and thank you all for uh, joining us today. We had a great talk with Hanshi Brian Hobson, and I look forward to seeing you next week on Black Belt Life.